Welcome to 1856 First Church, Pella, Iowa podcast. Here we are, Brianne, another podcast, 1856. Glad you're here. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Pastor Bob. I got a little cold and lost my voice, so I'm starting to sound a little different. Yes, you sound like you're a little congested, but quite frankly, I've been because it's harvest time out there, Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of dust, pollen in the air, so I've been sneezing and scratching and taking my allergy pill. Well, maybe that's what it is. I'll hope. Yes, I oftentimes, when people have terrible colds, I say, are you okay? And they'll say, just allergies. It's always just allergies. So I do hope you feel better. But what a great time of year. Autumn came on oh, Sunday. I know. It's great. And it's as though the Lord just turned the temperature down. Yeah, it's beautiful out. Beautiful sleeping weather. And uh, yeah, love these mild temperatures. I do too. But I hear they're leading to something. Oh, really? I hear that winter comes next. Oh, yeah. And so it'll only be a matter of time when... The lawnmower gets put away and the snowblower comes out. How exciting is that? I know. My kids look forward to it. I can't say that I always do. Everybody looks forward to snow in December. Uh But beyond that, it is a blight. Yes. It's not pretty anymore after that for some reason. Well, I feel like we're into a normal week. There's no really big special events. We're just kind of doing ministry as normal, which is plenty stimulating, very exciting, And uh, grateful for the many things that go on. We happen to be doing this on a Wednesday rather than a Tuesday. So we've got our whole kitchen crew downstairs Uh making a wonderful meal for tonight, of which I forgot what the menu is, but I'm sure it's going to be great. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, we've got a staff meeting in a little while, so it's an exciting day and it's going to be an exciting week. What do you have? I have the same thing today. I've got uh, my Women of the Word group and then our staff meeting following and hoping to get a little homeschooling in there later today with the kids. Sounds great. So we had a good Sunday last week. Um, You know, we had church in the morning in our classes. I was so excited. We had our starting point class. We had 10 people come to that. Just it's always such a delight and an honor for me to get to know new people that have come into First Church. I always start out the class by saying, how did you how did you come to First Church? Mm-hmm. You know, did somebody invite you? What were the circumstances and and why did you stay? Good. And that really blesses me to hear their answers. At the end of the class, everybody said, Yeah, we want to be partners in missions. So mm-hmm. probably in a few weeks, probably mid October, we'll be receiving these dear people as partners in mission and we give all praise to the Lord for that. That's great. Yeah, you also had a successful men's breakfast, I heard too. Hey, it was dynamite. We ended up, I think, with sixty two guys that morning. Uh, my cooking crew showed up at uh, 5.30 a.m. They did a great job making scrambled eggs and pancakes and bacon and all the other things that go with the breakfast. But Bob Vanderplatz was here from the family leader, and uh, I'd never met Bob before. I, I thought he was outstanding. Great. And it turned out, as we were talking, he was at Northwestern College in Orange City, Iowa, when I was at Dort College in Sioux Center, Iowa. And uh, so we were there at the same time, so... I'm sure that our paths crossed in some way, but he didn't know it was me and I didn't know it was him. But uh, he's doing, I think, a a great work for the kingdom uh, Mm -hmm. here in Iowa. Uh, I just appreciate his his godliness um, and his desire to see families be built up here in our state. And um, yeah, I'm glad we have a relationship with him and he certainly blessed the men. Yeah, I know my husband had great feedback. He had some good notes. Well, that's good. Then he can come home and share it with his wife. That's right. They were. Yeah, so we don't have many things going on other than uh, we've got uh, the three-on-three basketball tournament coming up. That's this week, isn't it? Yeah, so wow. the weather, I think, is looking good so far. Looks looks like a great day. So I hope that will be good. And then people can still join the Sunday morning adult study, can't they? Yeah, you know, they can. We're, uh, we're getting into it this week. I know in our systematic theology class, we're going to begin talking about the doctrine of God. Right. And uh, so, yeah, they're welcome to join mine, Bible Blueprint, uh, Prayer 101, absolutely. Yeah, a lot of good stuff going on. Well, shall we uh, talk about fashion? I don't know. <laughs> you know, I obviously am sitting here as one who is just the epitome of fashion, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you definitely right. have a calling card. Yeah, Everybody right. Knows the well, shirts you wear. Well, today I'm wearing my Chicago Cubs shirt because they did win yesterday. Great. And uh, the season is coming to an end, uh, and which I'll put my shirts back for next year. Because wow. when you're a Cub fan, it's mm-hmm. always about 
next year. That's right. It's all about next year. Well, I definitely would say that you do have a fashion. Everybody knows you as the pastor that wears Hawaiian shirts. Well, go on. <laughs> Yes, you have a great fashion. Well, Sunday, you actually kind of talked about fashion. We had 1 Corinthians 11, 1 through 16. We didn't get through the whole chapter, but you titled it Hats and Hair. I never really thought we would be discussing fashion, but uh, you had also described this passage as a leapfrog passage. (laughs) Why did you describe it as a leapfrog passage? Well, I believe pastors, and I'm not suggesting that I've never not been guilty of it myself, but sometimes come up to what could be perceived as a little bit of a difficult passage and up, let's leapfrog over that and go to the next one. Mm -hmm. And uh, because sometimes, you know, I'll just say this as a pastor. Yeah, I had to roll up my sleeves last week a little bit Mm -hmm. higher than I normally have to because you really have to spend more time in the text Mm -hmm. to really understand what it says. And then you're going to communicate it to your your church so that it'll be plain. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because this is God's word too. Does it say some things that are maybe a little bit difficult for people? Absolutely. But you know what? If we don't teach the whole word of God, Mm -hmm. then on the things that we decide to skip over, people form their own opinions. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then later on, and I know this already because people have already talked to me. I've had a few people. I don't always have this. People have come to me and talked to me about the sermon. Hey, I didn't understand this. Did you really mean this? And, you know, sometimes I'll say this. um, You know, the issue really isn't with me. Mm Mm-hmm. The issue might be with what is in the text. I think one person said, you know, I deliver the mail. I didn't write the mail. God Mm -hmm. wrote the mail here. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, do I believe that Scripture sometimes can uh, kind of push us a little bit? Mm -hmm. Because maybe I believe something different and I have to be brought back in alignment with God's Word. And I think this is definitely one of those passages. Yeah, well, I certainly appreciated Uh, your efforts, and I hope the rest of the congregation was blessed too, because I was certainly blessed by it. Um, You kind of started the talk off about culture and dress, and you gave the example back in the 40s and 50s when fedoras were a thing that men wore to church, and then how John F. Kennedy, who had this beautiful mop of hair, chose not to wear a hat, and how that was a little bit taboo during the time. So you would kind of Uh, progressed, you know, we see this throughout um, humanity and our culture and time. And uh, the people, as they change the way they dress, it says something about them. Um, And then it communicates to the culture of the time. And it also develops opinions uh, for people on how they dress. So you then use that to lead into verses one and two, talking about uh, traditions and and, uh, some history of the church. So what traditions of the time was Paul talking about in verse 2? Well, you know, to to move into this passage that we talked about on Sunday, Paul is definitely talking about some fashion and cultural things. I mean, he does mention hats, he does mention hair, and so there's something to be said about that. Now, what we have to recognize in that passage is he's dealing with a cultural thing at the time of the Corinthian church. But that doesn't mean we get to take our scissors out and cut that out of the Bible and say, well, that doesn't apply to us. Mm -hmm. We're not dealing with a hat and hair issue at First Church, Mm -hmm. okay? That's not the point. So we have to look at this cultural thing that Paul is dealing with and then say, okay, how does those principles that were read by the first readers apply to us today? Definitely they do. And then, of course, also weaved into this passage is this whole issue of headship. Mm -hmm. So Paul just, I think, beautifully connects these two things. There was something in the day that was being said when a woman wore a hat, didn't wear a hat, or a man wore a hat. Mm -hmm. Now again, we don't take the hat principle into into our church today. There's other dress issues, but we cannot ignore what Paul is saying about the headship that's going on and the order that's going on. Right. Yeah, you had talked about as Christ is the head of man and the man should be the head of the woman because God is the head of Christ. Um, So he kind of summed it up at the time. It was, you know, the covering of the head for the man was bad, but the covering for a woman was good. So Well, and and, and just to interrupt there. Sure. So what what I think Paul was saying, rather, rather than maybe using the bad and good, it communicated something. Okay. And, and what the man wearing the hat in, it communicated 
disrespect. So yes, mm-hmm. bad. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and, and when a woman didn't wear a hat, that also communicated disrespect. So in other words, they weren't honoring the authority Sure. Uh, that was the message. Now, that same message wouldn't be communicated. I mean, if a man walks in uh, next week to church wearing, say, a Chicago Cubs hat in a church, mm-hmm. some people might be apt to say, hey, take it off. You know, we're in mm-hmm. church. That's not respectful. Sure. I don't think that people would immediately say, that's disrespectful to Christ. Right, right. So how is Paul's discussion there is this distinctions between men and women in worship? Um, relate to us today cultural and societal context with that so wearing the hat versus not wearing the hat well i i would take the wearing of the hat not wearing the hat completely off the table Mm -hmm. i i don't think that that's culturally normative to what we're dealing with today and as you know at the end of my message after i talked about all these very delicate issues about headship i said folks we can't disregard the fact that there's some statements here about dress, Mm -hmm. okay? I don't want to ignore that. So yes, do we make statements with our dress? Yes, we do. Um, What's going on with what you wear? You are raising children still at your home. You have daughters. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've had this conversation. We communicate something with our our dress. Mm -hmm. So I use the word modesty. Modesty is a word that was there in the Corinthian church. Modesty still today. I believe we should teach our children, particularly our our daughters, how to dress modestly. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even with our boys, are we wearing things that are are designed to bring attention to ourselves? Right. Because for the sake of the gospel, we're out there trying to point people to Jesus. Mm -hmm. So anything that gets in the way of us accomplishing our mission for Christ then we've really got to ask the question, is that appropriate? Right. And so it's sensitive, mm-hmm. and believe me, it's not always black and white. I will say, when I started wearing my Hawaiian shirts to church, mm-hmm. there were some people that had a problem with it. Well, I wasn't trying to make a statement. Sure. I didn't like wearing suits and ties, and I looked out at my church at the time. Nobody else was wearing suits and ties. Mm. So I thought, well, I'm going to be comfortable Mm-hmm. And uh, so for me, comfortable was just putting on a loose-fitting shirt. Some of those had flowers on it. Some of them didn't. Mm-hmm. But there were a few people in church that just thought, in order for you to be a pastor, you need to be wearing a suit and tie. You need to be choking on a tie every week <laughs> while we sit there in comfort. And so, you know, people are over that now. It's just not a normative thing. However, if I come up in church on Sunday morning wearing jean cutoffs yeah. and my flip-flops and a T-shirt, I'm telling you, I'm going to throw a lot of people. And people might ask, what's the deal? Right. Well, I, I like this. I would say, well, no, that's not the point. The point is suddenly I'm bringing all this attention to myself mm-hmm. when I'm supposed to be pointing people towards God. Right. Yeah, you had us read aloud as a congregation that we must conform to God's character, plan, purpose, and order. Um, because if we don't, uh, we're going to go our own way. So you did a wonderful job. I, I, I took several notes here with uh, the headship aspect, that the Godhead has headship, and Jesus obeyed his Father to the point of death. And the Father and Son were equal in divinity and in glory, but there was a distinction there. And so I was wondering if you could go into a little bit more of the concept of headship from you know God the Father to Christ and how that applies to man and woman. Yeah, so... It should not come as a surprise to anybody that God has ordered things. He's brought order and harmony to this world that he created. Mm -hmm. It's not this spastic, chaotic mess of things. There's order there. So within the Godhead, there's Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In this passage, we're talking about Father and Son. So the Father, God so loved the world that he sent his Son. Well, our basic understanding of the Trinity is this. There's three persons in the Godhead. They are equal, Mm -hmm. equal, equal. But that doesn't mean that each of them doesn't have a different function. So God the Father sends God the Son. Mm -hmm. God the Son follows that directive. When God the Son was here on earth, he continually said to people, I am doing my Father's will. Mm -hmm. That wasn't because he was less than the Father. It meant that the Father had that function of authority that he gave to his son to do all the way to the cross so think about that Mm -hmm. 
Jesus, who was equal with God, left the splendor of heaven because he was following the will of his Father and then ultimately went to the cross. Okay, so equal, equal, equal. Well, then Paul brings us to Christ is over man. Okay? Mm -hmm. And so, okay, that makes sense. So I am am to love my wife, Ephesians says, Mm -hmm. as Christ loved the church. And then it says about women, women, you are to submit to man. Mm -hmm. Well, submitting to their authority, again, equal, equal, equal. It doesn't mean that this husband is somehow lording this authority no more than God the Father lorded his authority over God the Son. Mm -hmm. So these are functions, these are roles, this is for harmony. And so I I believe it's absolutely leak-proof what uh, God has presented there. Right. Yeah, you had said order is not about uh, superiority or inferiority, Um, and you'd referenced Um, several verses here so in psalms and hebrews and romans and you had just talked about you know church watch your leaders um and you'd kind of given an example as we were talking before the podcast to those young married couples and how or engaged couples excuse me um can you go through that analogy again of how you know that headship of roles of man and women there well, yeah, when, uh, you know, I've done a lot of premarital counseling, I always qualify that. I'm not a therapist. I do pastoral premarital counseling with many couples. You know, most of the time, the couples are getting married in our church. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that we talk about with uh, in our six-week regimen is, you know, the roles in the marriage. And mm-hmm. I talk about headship. I talk about what biblical headship is. And I said, a lot of people think that it's, you know, this man over the woman concept, you know, women be quiet and listen. Mm -hmm. I said, that's not how the Bible presents it. It presents it, man, man, you go first. You go first, you lead. She is your partner in this. Mm -hmm. She is your helper. That's how the Bible has described that. Well, we live in a society that says, no, no, you know, women... You, you do whatever you want, and, mm-hmm. and, and there's no reason that you have to submit to anything. Well, that's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. We submit all the time. I submit to a police officer that pulls me over if I'm going too fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I submit to them. We're equal. We're both people, mm-hmm. but that person has a role that's been given to them that they have the authority to do what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And so we actually do submit all the time. But I will say, as sinful human beings, we don't always like to submit. Mm -hmm. We like to have our own way. So, yeah, I explained that to couples, and I just said, this is a good thing because this is God's design. Mm -hmm. But one more thing with that. I have to always say this. Men, you have an immense responsibility with that. So it's not like you get an authority card and you can do with it whatever you want. Remember, the scripture says, love your wife like Christ loved the church yeah well, what did christ do for the church he died for them mm-hmm. so just built into that is that whole concept of the christ was serving mm-hmm. the very people that he had this authority over yeah it probably gives in marriage a very comforting feeling to both you know the wife and the husband when that right ordering is in place where they know that the husband is going to take care of them and that he's going to lead in that way. Mm-hmm. So it does. it's very comforting in my own um, marriage. So you went on to explain how, you know, how we're supposed to bring honor to God because we're image bearers, and that woman is also made in the image of God. So why was woman created? <laughs> it, well, God makes it very clear it's not good for man to be alone. Mm-hmm. So he created a, a helper. Mm-hmm. And and uh, and that's a beautiful thing that God created a helper to come alongside, to come alongside. So so Adam's been given these things to do, and you know I can't begin to get in the in the mind of God there, but God decided it's, it'd be better for him to have a helper. Mm-hmm. So from Adam's rib, woman is created. I mean, it was just a wonderful scene. I mean, if you could just imagine this, I mean, Adam's in a deep sleep. God does this miraculous thing, pulls a rib out, mm-hmm. and then and then and then there's a woman that's laying there, sitting there, whatever. Okay, I'm just imagining this, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking Adam comes out of his sleep, sees this creature that he's never seen before, and and there's there's these words that come to him that forever gave her that name. Whoa, man. 
<laughs> Whoa, man. And thus she became woman. Uh-huh. Uh, that's a joke, uh-huh. just so everybody knows. But anyway, anyway, um, the fact of the matter is, is she came alongside Adam and mm-hmm. helped him. Mm-hmm. Helped him do the very things that God had said, I need you to do. And so that's that beautiful partnership mm-hmm. that was all defined before the fall. So yeah. some people think, um, well, that's a result of the fall. That's a result of sin. No, 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 no. That was God's design in the first place. Right, yeah. You said that Eve was you know, a necessary partner in projecting God's glory through her husband because God made woman for man. And I just, I loved that, the whole image and the helper aspect and how it is a beautiful uh, plan that God had in place. And like, like you said, even before sin, before the fall, it was in place. So you brought it back to the dressing and then you had that, you know, Paul was calling for authority on the woman's head in that time of culture. And the hat, it represented an attitude of submission of God's ordained authority in man. So the focus of the wife's attitude on her outward side was also reflecting what was on her inside. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I appreciated that. Um, then you have read uh, verses 11 through 16. So, nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman, and all things are from God. And I just love how that verse to me, just, you know, brought that all together. And so Paul was calling for women to their submission to their family um, and in prayer, and uh, that it is a matter of order. So how would you answer a question? I'm going down now to 13, uh, which I'll read for you, which is, judge for yourselves, is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? How would you answer that question for us today? Yeah, well, I'm going to go back to my original statements at the beginning and to say, I think the whole hat thing is is off the table. That for today, mm-hmm. that's that's a cultural thing that was for that day. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, my wife, for instance, prayed in church on Sunday. Mm-hmm. Nobody, nobody would ever expect her to be wearing a hat. Okay, mm-hmm. nobody went. Oh, she's not wearing a hat. Mm-hmm. Quite frankly, if she would have come up wearing a hat, she thought, "I wonder why Patty's wearing a hat today." Okay, mm-hmm. it's just it's just not culturally normative to our time. Mm-hmm. I had somebody approach me this week and said, "So should I wear a hat to church next week?" I said, right. "No. I mean, you can wear a hat if you want to, but you're not going to be wearing a hat because in any way, shape, or form mm-hmm. do I believe the Bible is directing us. Look at the norm for the day. If a mm-hmm. woman came." to what they call church at that time, Mm -hmm. not wearing a hat. Yes, there would be people that knew that there was a statement being made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when we finished after that, we rounded back to are we dressing for our attention of ourselves? So what warnings does Paul give towards that when we um, start to draw attention to ourselves rather than God? Well, I think if we take the principles out of this passage and apply it to dress, we we have to ask ourselves the question, in 2024, what does our dress communicate to other people? Mm-hmm. Now, many people know I was a choir director for many years. That's mm-hmm. what I did part-time when I was still uh, working as a principal in schools. So initially, all the choirs wore robes. That was the thing. Mm-hmm. And one of the reasons that they would wear robes is so that there would be this unity that's expressed in dress. Mm -hmm. There would be really no attention brought to people in that. Well, I came to a point with choirs that they didn't want to wear robes anymore. They thought that they were Uh antiquated and or maybe they were old and we didn't want to spend the thousands of dollars. So, okay, you're just going to wear what you would wear to church. Mm -hmm. But we had to give guidelines. And so I remember, you know, having to give these ladies, and I think you know what I'm talking about when I say this, don't bring attention to yourself with what you're wearing. Don't make mm-hmm. people focus on you. And that could go from inappropriate necklines to mm-hmm. exposure of skin, whatever. Okay, mm-hmm. just don't bring attention to yourself. But then also don't wear, you know, like a neon pink dress either that's going to... So they got it. Mm-hmm. They got it. And the same thing with men. Okay, we're going to be... Let's, let's wear, you know, white light shirts, et cetera, sure. and, and we're going to wear long pants. Modesty, mm-hmm. don't bring attention. Mm-hmm. And so now church has turned into um, 
a lot of different styles and fashions, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. It's not as pronounced here in Pella, Iowa, as it was in Southern California. Mm -hmm. And I'll just say, as we were reaching more and more people from Christ, especially from different cultures, we never knew what walked in. For instance, we could have a non-Christian who walks in, and we're so grateful that they're walking to church, but for them, this is in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. for them, the biggest thing in their life today was not going to church. It was that the Lakers were playing the Celtics later in the day, so they <laughs> yeah, came right. in with their Laker jersey. Now, we're never going to tell them to take that off, but here is what I'll tell you what happens. Mm -hmm. There are many that became a Christian. Mm. And as they become a Christian, they realize the Lordship of Christ is going to take over all my life. It doesn't happen instantly, but soon they realize... I can't believe that the first thing I put on in the morning was my Lakers jersey. Mm -hmm. I think I should look a little different when I go to church. Right. And that's a beautiful thing. I don't want to bring attention to myself. Mm -hmm. I actually want the focus to be on God. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I think that those are the kind of principles that Paul wants us to take from this passage. Sure. I'm wondering if some people here, you don't have to take care of yourselves, but that's not what we're saying, is that you still should you know, take care of yourselves and honor God, but it's also honoring him with your body as well as how you're dressing and so that things are pointing towards him. Um, and that's a really good point, Brianna. Yeah. You know, hey, take a shower. You know, <laughs> we all appreciate and, and, that. And, 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 you know, I think excellence should define us all. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, um, yeah, you know, iron your clothes. Mm -hmm. um, look presentable. I think that's, that's always a good thing. So, yeah, I don't want to bring attention to myself, but I also don't want to bring attention to myself because I look like Mr. Frump. Right. Mm -hmm, right. Well, you had challenged us at the end of your sermon just to say, okay, have you let go of our own image to reflect his image? And are these specific, any specific um, fashion trends that we need to avoid because they're not modest? And you also said, have you checked your motives about your fashion decisions? And I thought those were all really good reflective questions for individuals. Because as our culture changes, I think it's going to be more of a question. Well, and with those questions, so I use an example at near the end of my sermon, you know, I used to be a middle school principal. Mm -hmm. I hated detailed dress codes. Yeah. I hated that there was, you know, 27, 30 rules because all that did was set me up and my teachers up mm -hmm. to be like police in the classroom. And, you know, measuring this, doing that, looking at that, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. I really believe, I believe this with my middle school students, I certainly believe it with adults, we can ask the question, what are we trying to convey? Right. You know, young ladies, what are we trying to convey? Mm -hmm. Do we want to look like the rest of the world in the way we dress? Do we want to look like the latest rock star on you know, the cover of, well, we had albums then, <laughs> we don't do that anymore. What, what are you trying to convey? Mm -hmm. We had a big gang problem in Southern California, and mm -hmm. gang gang issues. Uh, you know, they wore the baggy pants yes. and, the, and the big baggy stuff. You know why gangs wear that? Because they got weapons. Mm. So when my Christian kids show up at the school, kind of looking like that, right. so what are you trying to convey? Mm -hmm. So as I presented that to my kids, I said, let's just answer that question. So rather than giving you a dress code with all these things, I'm going to give you just a few things to guide you in that, just a few basic right. concepts, because they're all based upon what are we trying to convey to the rest of the world? Yeah, no. And it worked. That's good, yeah, it's good thoughts, good thoughts. So will we continue this Sunday in chapter 11, or will we? Well, to yes, because of course, Brianne, as you started, we uh -huh. don't do leapfrogging. That's right. So I would suggest that we have three sermons in a row that, you know, um, they are going to be stimulating from the standpoint that it might challenge people's belief systems of what they believe. So mm -hmm. this week, for some people, they hadn't heard about biblical headship. Mm -hmm. And so people are still processing that. You know, this week, what we're going to do is we're going to walk up to a passage about communion, the mm -hmm. Lord's Supper. Again, this was an issue in the Corinthian church. Paul was seeking to address it. And I would submit that this passage have has often been misinterpreted by the church. Mm -hmm. And so um, it's not a matter that I'm right, okay? Right. I have to do all my hard work in this. But I want to really look at what the Lord is seeking to communicate to us about the Lord's Supper, this beautiful, beautiful sacrament that we have Great. that promotes intimacy with him and others. Right. 
Well, with all of this uh, fashion talk, and uh, it seemed, you know, it was very serious. So I brought a dad joke today to conclude our time. Wow. <laughs> and all this heaviness, really, what's with the dad joke the, that you have? Yeah. Why do cows have hooves and not feet, Pastor Bob? Why do cows have hooves and not feet? I can't even begin to imagine. I want to milk the answer from you. <laughs> they lack toes. They lack toes. <laughs> well, Brianne, um, uh, if we had a crowd here, they'd all be moaning, moaning right now. I know. Yeah, but thank you for oh, that. Yes. In the midst of your nasalness, and I hope you're going to mm-hmm. be in church on Sunday, right? I hope to be as well. I hope that our family is healthy. It's going to be a great day. It's going to be September 29th. Mm-hmm. This week, what we're also doing special, we have certain grades that we give Bibles to every year for kids. Yes. And so those mm-hmm. Bibles are going to be distributed this week, and just a, a wonderful time to honor some of our kids. And uh, yeah, so that'll be a little uh, extra celebration in our worship this morning. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a good week. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at 930 on Sunday. 930 on Sunday. Thanks, Brian. Hope you feel better. God Thank bless you. you. And folks, we'll see you on Sunday. Thank you.